Welcome to the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Welcome to ITSP Magazine. Knowledge is power, now more than ever. And here we go. This is Redefining Society podcast. And nowadays, podcast also means video. I don't make a, I don't make a, a, a separate introduction for the media that we're going to use. So if you're watching the video, you can already see that I have a guest with me. And if you're listening to the audio, I'm, I'm going to tell you that I do have a guest. And I have to thank, before I, I announce you, um, to thank the person that made this happen, which is my my friend Charlie Charlie Camarda, uh, co mentor at the Mentor Project, and also somebody that flew in space with you on a very important mission. So I'm kind of giving away <laughs> what we're going to talk about here, and my guest is Eileen Collins. And uh, if you don't know who she is, you probably need to look it up because she has made some important things happen. For, for a lot of people, I'm going to say for humanity and uh, for space exploration and also the first uh, woman to command a space shuttle uh, mission. That and many other things that I don't even want to start reading because it would take forever. So I'd rather say welcome to the show, Eileen, uh, Eileen Collins, and uh, introduce yourself in, in the in the shorter possible way and, and then we can start talking about your book and many other things that we are planning to cover. Well sure thank you Marco and thanks for the invitation to talk with you today and uh, I don't know what else to say about myself um, you know I grew up in upstate New York in a small town uh, kind of lower middle class family. I like to tell people my story which was, you can, in this country, you can be whoever you want to be. Uh, you don't have to grow up rich. You don't have to have, you know, parents that are well-connected. Um, but what we had was a very, uh, I want to say, a tight family. We, of course, we had our problems. Uh, every family does, but we uh, supported each other. My parents told me that I could uh, do what I wanted to do in life and be what I wanted to be. Um, and, and I saw by watching them that hard work was, you know, and, and discipline were needed to really uh, reach your dreams. So I joined the Air Force and uh, Air Force pilot, Air Force test pilot, uh, became an astronaut. I flew four times in space. And now I can say I'm an author. And I'll show you, I wrote a book. And, <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about. Yes. It just comes out in March of 2023. So the paperback version, uh, the hardback has been out for a while. So uh the, the book that I wrote is is to inspire young people. So young people can read it. Um, it's uh, it, it, I wrote it to inspire them to look into STEM degrees, STEM with science, technology, engineering, and math career fields, as well as the military. And a lot of young people don't really know. And I think that through reading and you, you know, read biographies, uh, things that other people have done, and it'll give you an idea what those career fields are like. So, uh, that's why I wrote the book. And uh, so that's just uh, maybe a short synopsis of, of what I've done. Absolutely. And it, it makes me think because I actually did listen to, to the book and I finished, uh, you know, before the weekends so a few days ago. Um, I'm fresh of uh, a beautiful ride, actually, I have to say. And I, there is a little joke that I want to say because I, I know that on the audio book, I don't have the actual book, but on the audio book, there is a note from uh, from uh, Tom Hanks that says, what a read. And because it's so small in my phone when I play the book, I thought it said, what a ride. And I, I agree on what a ride because it really bring the the reader or the listener in the case of the audiobook with you in this adventure, not only in your career, but also, I mean, you start literally the book with the experience of taking off on, on the space shuttle. So it's very emotional. I, I think it is, it is very, very inspirational. And I hope that you get the point. But one of the things you say in the book at the end, you said the people were asking you, where is the book? 
and then you say, okay, here is the book. <laughs> so why did it take you so long? I mean, I'm sure you've been busy, but were you waiting for a moment in, in uh, I don't know, in your history and in, in our society that you felt like it was more important now than ever? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I'm a mother of two children <clears throat> and my husband is an airline pilot. So, and the fact that I was an active astronaut, my life was so busy. I really had, no, I did not have time to write <clears throat> let me say a quality book, a book that I wrote. And I did not want a ghost writer and I didn't want someone else to write it for me and put my name on it. I wanted it to be my book. And I think back to the time uh, when I was an astronaut, I had several authors approach me and ask, could they co-author a book with me? And every time I said no. And this started in 1999 after my first flight as commander. And then again in 2005, when I flew my last flight as commander, which was the return to flight mission after uh, the terrible uh, Columbia accident, there was so much story there to tell. And, it, you know, it was so important that I get that story out. But I, it was probably the worst time in my life. I, f I flew the mission, which was a huge success. But when I came back from that, we had a series of disasters in my family. Uh, my husband's company went bankrupt. A hurricane hit Houston. I mean, this was just a month after we returned from the flight. And then uh, three months after my flight, my mother died. And then two months after that, my father died. And there was even more going on. I had uh, the post-flight report, the post-flight uh, briefings and uh, traveling that I needed to do. And my children were nine years old and four years old. So I had so much going on in my life at the time. I, and I had authors asking me, let's write a book. And I, no, no, I can't write a book now. So, you know, years went by and I thought, well, maybe now's the time to write a book. But authors and publishers want the book to be timely. And all those years had gone by. So they had really lost interest because, oh, that your mission was so long ago, it's not in the news anymore. So I waited until my youngest was off in college and then the pandemic hit and I had a lot more time because I wasn't traveling. And my, I have a co-author, Jonathan Ward, who had been asking me, let's write a book. And I called him back and said, I think it's time. I, I, I have the time to write a quality book and I wanted to write the book. And I wrote it like one chapter at a time and sent it to Jonathan and he, he would you know, fix it up and make it sound better. And, you know, he would interview me, uh, why don't you add this? Why don't you take this out? So we really, I'm not a professional writer. Jonathan really made it a quality book. And Jonathan also wrote the proposal to send off, which is not easy. That took quite a bit of time, but he sent the proposal off to the publishers. And he also, there were several chapters that Jonathan, uh, we were getting behind schedule. So I asked Jonathan, can you write a couple of these chapters for me? And then he would interview me and then we would kind of switch roles. But for the most part, I wrote the majority of the book. Uh, and people are even telling me they can hear my voice in the book, which, which I find interesting. I'm not sure how they see that, but apparently there's a certain way that I talk. And people that know me say they can hear my voice in the book. And it... Uh, we, we also had to cut quite a bit out. We had to get it below 90,000 words. And I think we originally had like 120. So we had to uh, cut a good, almost 25% had to be cut out. And uh, we might even have enough for a second book. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> well, I have to say that there is a lot of, I mentioned that it's both emotional and sometimes a little bit technical because that you explain a lot of details in, you know, what it went wrong, uh, you know, the, the reason why maybe a, fl a flight is postponed and, and, you know, and all the people that, that work around. Because that's something we tend to forget, how many people actually work on a, on a project. I, I was reading some incredible number of those that are working on the Artemis now. Uh, you know, it, it gives job to so many, so many people, and they're all responsible for the success of, of the mission. You're like for being so long because you, you start from when you are, you know, literally a, a little a little kid that get inspired. And you're going to have to tell me how that happened, that that, uh, that you get in love with 
airplanes and the idea to fly because it wasn't even in your in your family if i if i recall from from the book but but the details that you're putting in that i mean you you must have taken i don't know a diary or some notes throughout your life because i sometimes i don't even remember what i have for for breakfast the day before so were you actually taking notes also due to all your reports and the things that you need to do when you are both a a test pilot and a pilot and then a commander of of a space shuttle uh, yeah yes i have tremendous amount of notes i have so many that i actually have a <clears throat> storage facility because i can't fit it all in my house <laughs> and these are uh, checklists i mean i could just go on and on in fact the national air and space museum wants my records mm. uh, which i haven't i haven't given them away yet i I still want them because I used them to write the book. Mm -hmm. I have mostly I use my logbook. So every flight I have a, I, every time I flew a um, flight in any airplane, I, that night I came home and I wrote it down in my logbook. And if anything special happened, I put the notes there. So, I mean, I had things like who I flew with, what the tail number of the airplane was. You know, I had all kinds of details. And of course, the ones that I wrote about were the ones that, you know, when something really drastic happens in your life, you're not going to forget it. Uh, like the times mm -hmm. I uh, went into a thunderstorm or the times I avoided mm. a thunderstorm and, you know, was low on fuel in an airplane. That uh, third flight in the space shuttle where we had a leak, we had a hydrogen leak all the way to orbit. We also had an electrical short, uh, things that put you close to death. You're not going to forget those. So <laughs> many of those are just ingrained in my mind. Now, the part of your question that you asked about when I was young, my sister tells me, Eileen, you have an incredible memory because I'll talk to my sister about things that happened when we were kids. And she's like, how do you remember that? But yeah. I, for some reason, I think I have a, a very, my long-term memory is much better than my short-term memory. But I, I, you know, it's funny what you remember as a kid. And there's a message here for parents. The message is things that you say to your kids will echo in their mind for the rest of their lives. And I still remember, even today, things that my mom and dad said to me will just pop in my head based on some circumstance that I come across. The other thing is teachers. So I remember very specifically some of my teachers. You know, for example, the story about the day I decided I wanted to be an astronaut. I was in Mrs. Whitmarsh's fourth grade class and I had the magazine. <clears throat> it was, a, it was a, a junior scholastic with the article on the Gemini astronauts. It was like yesterday. I remember, I, I, in fact, I went and I tried to find that magazine somewhere and I, you know, I haven't been able to find it. But they had an article on the Gemini astronauts and I'm reading this thinking, that's what I wanna do. I wanna be an astronaut. And some of that came from the books that I read. You know, my mom took us to the library, like it was a routine on Saturdays in the winter when you couldn't really go outside because it was too cold. She took us to the library. And my dad in the summer would take us to the airport in the glider port. Uh, we have the National Soaring Museum near my hometown, soaring, gliding. And he would take us to the glider field or the airport and we'd watch airplanes take off and land. So I think things that your parents, uh, for um, people listening that are parents or are teachers, you just never know what little incident that you have happened with a child, your child, or one in your classroom, that they're going to remember forever. And I just give credit to, you know, teachers and parents everywhere that um, you don't have to be perfect. And sometimes kids learn a lot more from the mistakes that you make. And, you know, it, in fact, I don't even think perfect parents and perfect teachers are, are good for kids. Um, kids mm. need to see, you know, where, where you can do things better also well you know that i always think about when people like talk about an overnight success like in sports or in everything you know in music yeah that musician just had a hit um song well yeah no it, it, it that happened but to get there there is an entire history there is a family that maybe inspired them or a teacher or you know, or a lot of training on an instrument. And I'm just taking the, the, the music example. But of course, when people read your book, I mean, you flow like, um, I was looking for the number, but an incredible amount of 
hours, not only in space, obviously, but, you know, as a pilot. And I want to touch to that because in this ride or read, uh, either you listen to me, what I read, <laughs> what I write, or Tom Hanks, what I read, um, I would like for you to explain to people listening right now and, and, and hopefully the people that can be inspired by you, you know, become, you know, be a role model as you are. Because I don't think people realize that there has been two women commander of the space shuttle, right? That's right. And I just got lucky because I realized that I had Pam, uh, Pam Melroy on a, on a show with me uh, two years ago. So I'm like, wait a minute, I'm going to have both of them. <laughs> I got so lucky to talk with. And how hard it was all, you know, the, I don't know, the, the barrier, the obstacle that a woman, when you did it, and even now, it's, I'm sure it's much harder than being a man, but to actually get all the loops that you have to go, because you couldn't be a, a fighter pilot, you couldn't log the hours, it's kind of like, at a certain point, the book becomes like, oh my God. I mean, you know you made it, because that's in the past, but there was so much. So maybe give an idea of how far we have gone and how far your contribution to this maybe for, for women to really look at the stars and say, I, I can do it now. And, you know, a trailblazer, literally. Well, yeah, I think I, I can give you a, a quick history of, you know, women pilots. And you can go all the way back to the Wright brothers. Um, there was a woman named Bobby Trout who, you know, I, I'm going back to like, 1915 or 1920, um, Orville Wright signed her uh, pilot's license and Bobby was in her 90s. She gave me her pilot's license and I took it up with me on my first flight in the space shuttle. Oh, wow. So that's, you know, cool. that's like, you know, the future connecting with the past. Yeah. And the other thing is when I, was a, when I was a kid, I read books on the women Air Force service pilots who flew in World War II. And then there were the Mercury 13 women who did the testing for the Mercury space program. <clears throat> None of them were able to fly, but they did so well in the medical and psychological testing that they really did prove to NASA that women had the ability to be astronauts. Then in 1974, the Navy took their first women into active duty military flying. 1976, the Air Force took their first women into active duty military flying. I came in in 1978. Back in those days, women were not allowed to fly in combat. It was a test program. Can women, can women fly in the military? And of course the women did very well. Um, back in those days, we were allowed to fly trainers, cargo and tankers. Tankers are the in-flight refueling. Then in 1993, our country opened up combat flying to women. So now women could fly fighters and bombers and reconnaissance. So I was already an astronaut in 1993, so I never had a chance to fly uh, a combat aircraft. I mean, I did, I did fly some combat aircraft, but not operationally. I just flew them as a test pilot. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a little uh, history behind it. But I do want to add to that, on, on military flying, whether you're a man or a woman, it's really about discipline. And I think that I learned uh, discipline when I was, when I first joined the military and that discipline, what is that? It's like showing up on time. Um, it's like having a, I want to say a, uh, me a mental way of thinking that you have a responsibility to other people and you stick to that responsibility and you don't make excuses. So and I'd like to share uh, just briefly with your listeners uh, over the years of flying, I have learned uh, to be very disciplined because your life can depend on it. So you're really, <laughs> you're really kind of forced into it if you want to survive some of the harrowing circumstances that we fly in. So I uh, wrote in my book, a lot of this got edited out of the book, so I'll mention it here. I have a four-step process for dealing with mistakes, okay? So everybody makes mistakes. We need to be humble enough to admit that we made a mistake and learn from it. So my four-step process is, number one, admit, at least to yourself and to the people that need to know that you made a mistake. Number two is to fix your mistake. Number three is to do something to prevent it from happening again, either to yourself or to another person. 
Uh, that might mean like making a change in the checklist. And then number four, you move on. You know, don't dwell on your mistake. And I, I find that this uh, is important for people who are athletes. You know, if you're in the game and you've made a mistake, you just can't be dwelling on that because you're not going to play your best. You've got to, you know, remember it, but put it behind you. I learned from it. I'm going to move on. I'm going to keep, you know, working towards my mission, you know, whether it's to win the game or to complete, you know, your flight in the airplane or to com complete your space flight. And I have many things like that in my life. One, I have one for dealing with conflict procedures in my mind. I have one for dealing with decisions, procedures I go through in my mind. And I think that you know, we all face problems in our life. And I know that there's a lot of people, because I used to be one of them, to avoid problems, you know, maybe run away from your problems. And I found that that only makes them worse. So as soon as you get a problem, you categorize it not as a problem, but as a challenge. And you start, you can sit down and write out, you know, this is what I'm going to do, or this is what I'm not going to do. Or you can talk to somebody about it, but look at every problem as a challenge. And that, that goes back to the discipline thing. And, you know, I, I raised two kids and they'll have a problem in their life. And I'm like, okay, let's just, you know, do I, do I need to deal with it right now? Or can I put it away and put it over here for a minute and come back to it? Uh, but come back to it with a, uh, with a procedure step by step by step to try to take this problem and, and uh, fix it, but don't avoid it completely. So those are just some of the things that I found, you know, dealing with, I think, uh, getting through life with, without uh, a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety, because I see a lot of stress and anxiety in our culture today, more so today than I did back in the 1960s when I was a kid in the seventies. And, and there's a lot of other reasons for that. Um, but I think that these are things that uh, help me. And I think having some humility through the whole thing too, um, you can let a lot of success go to your head, but there's going to be more problems down the line. So just be ready for it. Well, that's definitely a big lesson. And, and I have to say that the book is such a, it's, a story like an adventure which is true but also is a big lesson on on team and leadership uh, both i think and correct me if i'm wrong but i get that you you were lucky in a way to have people that were your leaders that kind of show you the way i'm not going to say in every circumstance because there are moments in the book that you're like oh why did that happen? Should it not be? But that's a lesson as well, right? Maybe you don't want to do the same thing. Like maybe that's the wrong way to it. But you have beautiful one that inspire you, and and you did inspire that. And I can say this because, you know, in one of my conversations actually with Charlie that we recorded about the the return to flight, he was telling me that. And I, I don't necessarily want to go in that particular area of the conversation, but it was a, a tough flight. Uh, and I think we can agree with that. There was a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of things about, you know, two space shuttle uh, had mortal accidents. So, you know, you guys were going back on that. And he was so, he was telling me like how your leadership was so important, like that everybody needs to, have something to say like if you're don't 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 say yes just because you're not the the, the commander actually you you need to tell what your dubs and maybe you, what your uncertainty is about something and and everybody is on that same uh, you know some adventure together and you, you gotta make it out of it so uh, i i think that's that's a very that's a very important lesson and and i don't know if you want to share other situation where this style of leadership it's it's important and and how is just not for when you are in extreme extreme situation like flying in space but also in in, in everyday life so some, maybe some so, advice so, of kids yeah, and that, that is a really important question and i because we all have leadership roles i mean even if you may not be like the designated boss you have times in your life where you well, people look up to you you're the leader and you know people want someone who's confident but here here's i think what my message is 
when I was younger, I was more of an autocratic leader. You know, I thought, well, I'm a woman in a man's world and it's the military and I've got to be decisive and I've got to give people the answers that they need and I've got to be the most knowledgeable person. So I studied a lot and I, you know, I found through making mistakes that if you are telling people what to do, that isn't always the right leadership style, especially once I became an astronaut and now I'm working with people who are extremely in intelligent, uh, they're decisive, they're really motivated, they want the mission to be successful. They don't need somebody telling them what to do. So, and especially after the accident, after the Columbia accident where I saw the mistakes that NASA had made and I had to put myself, I'm in the same culture, right? So how am I part of this mm -hmm. culture um, that made mistakes and how can I be better? So there were three things that I learned after the accident. One of them is to be a better listener and not just passively listening, but actively listening, like asking people, what do you think about this? You know, you just can't right. sit there and, and absorb it. You have to tell me, you have to think, what are you thinking? I want to know what you, th what you're thinking. So that's listening. The second one is humility. I think a lot of leaders go around with maybe, and maybe I was one of them, uh, acting like they were, or I am the know-it-all. And that's where the humility has to come in. People have to be, uh, I think, not intimidated by you. So I, as I uh, got to be more and more senior in the office, I started in the astronaut office realizing that maybe people didn't want to speak up to me because, you know, I've been there 10 years more than they have. And what can they tell me? No, no, no. It was important that I have a sense of humility as a leader so people will come to me. And that, that's really tied in with listening. And then the third one is creativity. You know, we had been flying the shuttle when the accident happened in 2003. We, I mean, we'd been flying the shuttle since 1981. And we were getting what, what we might say is operational and doing the same thing over and over again. And, you know, you really don't want to like be trying new stuff because, you know, maybe you might introduce risks into the operation. But there are times when you must to prevent accidents, you must try to do something different. And, and one of them was the rendezvous pitch around maneuver uh, that we did for the first time on our flight, uh, uh, the one that uh, Charlie was on with me. We actually, as we were approaching the space station, we actually turned the shuttle upside down so the crew on the space station could photograph our heat shield to make sure there was no damage to it. And that was something that never would have been approved before the accident. But that was a, a very creative engineer who came up with that idea. People uh, initially said, oh, we can't do that for a variety of reasons. You know, you know, of course, we can't do something that crazy. But I, when I heard about it, I thought, well, why don't we just try it in the simulator and see mm -hmm. if it's even possible? And it was. And it turned out not only was it possible, but it was very inexpensive and it was uh, very elegant operationally, and it was very doable. So that was an example of creative thinking after the accident that would not have happened before. And so I think that, you know, you can't carry every creative idea through to the end, but it's important to, as a leader, to go into people, or go up to people, go in their office, or, you know, when you're with them in a meeting and say, what do you think about this? Is there a better way to do it. You know, what are the problems here? You know, what are the things that frustrate you every day? Um, have you had an idea that was maybe squished two years ago and, you know, maybe now is the time to bring it back up again? So I learned to be that kind of a leader after the accident. And it is not easy. Let me tell you, it's always, it's always easier <laughs> to just say, hey, this is my way. We're doing it this way. But I think, you know, that if for an a leader to be too autocratic in a risky environment like spaceflight uh, can be dangerous. And I, so I think that the leaders in risky jobs like test pilot flying or spaceflight really, really need to be open minded listeners, sense of humility, invite creative ideas. And so I think that's that's where I changed. <clears throat> and it, it, when I say it's hard is because you can't go with every you have to occasionally go up to people and say, you know, we tried your idea. We can't 
use it. I'm sorry. I need to have you get on board with this other idea, which is the one we chose. And sometimes people are, you know, they're, they're upset that their idea didn't get carried through. But again, the, the leader needs to motivate that person to get back with the team. And you know, you're now a team member, we all have the same goal. And that's to get this flight safely uh, up in space and get the space station built. That was our ultimate goal was to get the space station built and fully operational. Yeah, I mean, there is an entire series of podcasts here. I can think just from what you said, I'd like you could have an episode on each single one of this, like innovation. Uh, we've never done it that, that way, so we're not going to do it. Well, that, that's the easy way out. But if you are in a in a, such a, a, a experimental environment like NASA is, I mean, then it, then we would have never even, you know, not even the Wright brothers would have taken off on a flight because people would be like, no, you can do that. We've never done it before, but yeah, guess what? <laughs> then you do. Exactly. Um, yeah, and then maneuver, uh, the description of it is very, very, um, very visual in, uh, in, your, in your book as well. And your visit to the, the mirror uh, that then become the International Space Station. I think you, people get an historical view on what happened there, the relationship with the Russians and hanging out with, uh, with them. It's, and then... It brings me to the overview effect that every astronaut, well, maybe not every, but many astronauts experience when they are above the planet and they're like, you know, we're all here together on, on this planet. Um, what I would like to do with the time that we have left, um, and I know we're going to talk next time, so I, I'm already telling people to stay tuned because we'll talk about the way you see and, and the future of space exploration. But what what do you do now? So you, you achieve all of this. It's your dream. That's what you set up when you were a little kid. And then you do that and even more, because you, you said at a certain point, like, I would have been happy if I was a, a test pilot. And then I would have been happy if I was the, the pilot, because, you know, and then commander, because you need to pilot at least twice, if I believe, in order to command a, a mission. And then you come back on your last flight, you raise the family, you deal with all the things that happen in, in life. And, uh, and, and then what you do, I mean... What are you doing now? You, you're speaking, you're inspiring other people to do what you've done. Tell me what, what it means to be an astronaut when you don't fly anymore. I'm very but, curious. You know, I would that. say <laughs> I spend the majority of my time speaking. And, you know, just last week I spoke at high school, uh, talked to the young people about uh, opportunities in uh, the Air Force, the military in general, and space. I showed them one of my videos of spaceflight. Um, I spoke to a local Air Force organization um, also last week and uh, talked to them about the future of space and uh, some of the things that I thought were important <clears throat> to help them in their careers. <clears throat> so I do a variety of speaking. And plus, the book has not been out for that long. So I'm still doing book signings and traveling around the country, going to various uh, museums and uh, just... Uh, wherever an invitation comes, uh, I try to do as many as I can. Um, I'm, I also do board work. And I there was a time when I was on eight boards, which it's too much. Don't ever do that many. <laughs> and now I'm only on a few. Uh, one of them is the Astronaut Memorial Foundation. Mm -hmm. And we memorialize the astronauts that lost their lives in space flight. And we also have an education, uh, the Center for Space Education, where we teach teachers how to uh, bring space into the classroom and inspire the kids in STEM. We host a robotics competition and, and there's many things that we do. We have an award that we present to teachers, uh, the Alan Shepard Technology and Education Award, which teachers are eligible for. They have to be nominated. And, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm a judge for a variety of awards and I do these things routinely every year. Um, I, for the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation and for the Rotary uh, Space Rotary Club in Houston. So I keep very busy. I, I actually tend to get overscheduled. And those are times when I need to like live one day at a time. <laughs> and sometimes emails don't get answered for a while. 
but I, I do keep pretty busy, but you've got to always maintain time for yourself. So I try to go to the gym every day that I'm not on travel. I go to the gym, uh, trying to, whether I do cardio or lift weights, uh, stay in shape. Um, I actually play video games cause I think they're, they actually help, uh, your mind stay sharp. Mm-hmm. And I read a lot of books. In fact, I got to tell you something funny. When I was a kid, I read a lot of science fiction, but now Mm. I love to read history. So I tell people that uh, when I was young, I read about the future. And now that I'm old, I read about the past, (laughs) which is actually uh, funny. But I'm reading I'm reading a book now on uh, the Battle of Thermopylae, which was uh, Mm. Greek history, 500 B.C. Um, You know, I've read a book on the Alamo and uh, recently and. Uh, uh, I could go on and on about uh, history. There's so much that we can learn from history because I believe human nature doesn't change. I mean, our, our tools and our technology changes and now it's changing rapidly, but it's interesting that as you read history, you see that human nature, we're still people, you know, we still have the same emotions and the same, I want to say motivations that people had, you know, thousands of years ago. And I, I just find this fascinating. So this is one of the things that I'm uh, doing now in my free time. And I think it's important that we always have free time scheduled for ourselves, because if we're just working all the time, you know, we're going to die young and, you know, from stress. So you need to always put time in for yourself. And I encourage people to do that. Absolutely. And I so agree with you. Most of my conversations are actually in between technology lately artificial intelligence and how it is actually a way that for us to look inside ourselves. like I feel like working on technology and especially when you start thinking about general artificial intelligence and and generative now with all the the chats and and the dolly and so on it's a way to to learn about ourselves because I agree with you We're, we're still driven by kind of the same um, you know, I mean, the DNA is there. We're, we're still reacting to certain things in a very primordial way, even if we have these amazing <laughs> tools in our hands. And that's something to consider. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like that about, about you because you would think that somebody that is being always to, to the highest level of performance and tasting airplanes and flying and reorganizing changing things to, to make it safer for the space shuttle. You, you think like that's what you do all the time. Just always look at the future. And I, I know you do that because in the next episode, we're going to talk about the future of space exploration. But I, I love how you look into the past. And I'm, I'm thinking one question I want to ask you before we start wrapping here is, is this. So when someone think about going to space, you think about pilots, you think about uh, mission specialists and so forth. And you think about people that come from the military. I mean, they all, Apollo, Mercury, they, they were all uh, military pilots. But the truth is that now when the people are going, spending time to the International Space Station, we're talking about researcher. Uh, we're doing medical research. You mentioned that many times, all the experiments that you actually do. You're not just flying around in the orbits. You're actually doing constantly every sort of experiments. And even the astronaut body in itself is an experiment out there. But where do you see it to... How can you give an inspiration to people that say, look, I'm interested in other things, history, for example, or philosophy or um, anything else, but I feel there is a, a big space for them in in space exploration as it become more the future of of humanity. What's your take on that? Into becoming more inclusive, not only from diversity perspective or or minority, but also for different disciplines. Like, yeah. Well, I one hundred percent support uh, expanding space flight to you know anybody who's interested and in, and. I think that you know, spaceflight has become also more international. We've got more uh, countries involved. Um, the for the professional astronauts, the medical requirements have been expanded. You know, you had to be almost phys- physiologically perfect back in the early days, and now they've really expanded. 
And we've got the commercial private companies going up and flying missions like completely independent of NASA. These are very important uh, missions. And, and the other thing is we've got to fly more and more and more because the more we fly, the safer it'll get and the cheaper it will get. And I would like to see the day when people could go to space as a vacation. And, you know, in the near future, it's still going to be too expensive. But when I can't say, but it's going to be uh, someday at the point where an average citizen can go for a space flight. And why is that important? Well, I believe that, you know, people will want to take care of our planet uh, more so if they've seen it from a distance. And I also think that if we don't, this is completely separate, but if we as humans don't get out into space, that someday we could use up all the resources on our planet to the point that we may even be hurting ourselves. Um, you know, how far can we grow? I mean, there's going to be a limit as to how, how far we can grow here on planet Earth because of the resources that we have. Now, I don't think we're there yet, but I think it's something that we need to start thinking about is we build space stations, we put space stations on the moon, and then we put space stations on Mars. And the next giant leap will be in propulsion. So right now it takes three days to get to the moon, for example. You can get to the space station in less than a day, but it takes three days to get to the moon. It takes at least six months to get to Mars. And that's if the planets are on the same side of the sun. If, if Mars and Earth are on opposite sides of the sun, it's a two-year trip because you have so much farther to go. Our closest star, Alpha Centauri, is like four plus light years. I mean, that's, I mean, if you could travel at the speed of light, you wouldn't get there for four years. I mean, that's completely uh, impossible to do uh, right now in one person's lifetime. So the next giant leap, I believe, will be in propulsion. We need to be able to travel faster. And we need a whole new creative idea on how to get to other stars in the Milky Way. And we have not figured this out yet. But mm -hmm. when we do, we may find another planet like Earth that people could live on. So that is certainly beyond our lifetime. But I think this is an idea that we need to pass on to young people. And, you know, think about history and Trans, like giant leaps in transportation. You know, a wheel was invented, you know, a millennia ago, somebody invented a wheel to help with transportation. You know, then you've got horses, you know, someone figured out how to use animals for transportation. You know, and then you've got trains and cars and the airplane was invented and then the rocket was invented. But we, we need like a uh, really uh, incredibly creative uh idea that we'll need, someone will have to invent or discover a way to travel beyond chemical propulsion and even beyond possibly nuclear propulsion. So, so these are some of the things I talk to young people about and try to inspire them when they go off to college to look into degrees in math, science, engineering, technology. Uh, we don't have enough people I mean, we do need people with degrees in English and history. Those are very important. But if a person has a talent in the technology area, you know, don't just discard that idea because you don't know anybody who's doing that. Mm -hmm. um, do some reading and listen to podcasts like yours and, you know, find out what the possibilities are out there. And I think if a person has a talent for STEM, they really ought to uh, look into those career fields. You know, who knows who our next inventor uh, is going to be or what the next major discovery will be. You know, I hope I'm alive to see it. But uh, so I try to inspire uh, people to think, again, creatively and outside of, you know, just what is possible today. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, one other thought, you mentioned artificial intelligence. You know, many, many decades ago, Arthur Clarke wrote a book, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where, you know, the computer, HAL, H-A-L was, you know, many of your listeners might be familiar with this. And that was artificial intelligence that just went uh, totally awry, went went crazy. And, you know, is that realistic? Who knows? Uh, but I think that, you know, reading books like that can kind of give you an idea, you know, uh, where can artificial intelligence go? And could it eventually end up being a risk 
Yeah, I mean, it can it can really solve a lot of risks, but it can it can also open up a lot of new risks and hazards and, you know, maybe something even dangerous for society. So uh, those are things I know that you look into. And I think uh, those are things we really need to be thinking about as we do this, you know, creative type of engineering uh, for the future. Absolutely. And, and one quick question, if uh, HAL 9000 actually did stick with the order that was given and kind of maximize that to the excess, or if it went crazy, so we can go philosophical on that. But but I, I to add to what you said, there's also other other field that I had conversation with, like you know there is um, medical profession in a, in a Mars colonization, and I don't like to call it colony colony because it kind of reminds me of past colony that are kind of like we go there to to take possession of things. But you know human installment there and and civilization that we may start on on those planets. But then you need rules, you know, you need legal aspect. It's it's an entire new, I mean, whose flag is going to fly there? So in a way, we can even open to lawyers, to, you know, doctors that are studying the way we can do there. I mean, you, you said to go to Mars, take a while. So if somebody's going to get sick there, who's going to who's going to take care of that? Is it going to be done remotely? Is it going to be done by AI? Is going to be, I mean... That's where you really go into sci-fi that become the, the reality well, of the future. I think you're making a very important point because space flight touches every single uh, discipline, every single career field. You mentioned doctor, lawyer, but we also need administrators. Uh, we need janitors. Uh, Teachers. Like, we, you need <laughs> we need people that know how to fix things, you know, different yeah. uh, technologists. Um, you know, we have historians in space, we have uh, people, we have space art, we have artists that are very successful do space art. And, and so I think that, you know, space flight, we shouldn't just think STEM. We need to think uh, how this is like space is a place. We used to say that back in the Air Force, back in the 1980s, this was mm. a, a saying that we had, space is a place. And it, it someday, it, I mean, if you, when humanity goes there, We'll be taking every aspect of humanity with us. And, and another thought with that is the Outer Space Treaty. So in 1967, mm. almost every country in the world signed the Outer Space Treaty. There's two key elements. One of them is you don't you will not put nuclear weapons in space, um, which makes total sense. And then the other one is, people may not know, the countries that signed the treaty are not allowed to claim any part of outer space as their own. So, for example, the Chinese can't land on the South Pole of the moon and say, we own it now. You can't come here because we own it. They signed the treaty. So did the United States, um, the Russians, and in pretty much every country that could be exploring. Now, those, those treaties do need to be updated. Um, there is the Moon Treaty, which was 1979, I believe. The United States did not sign the Moon Treaty. Because in there it says the moon is the providence of all mankind. So mm -hmm. if a country uh, went there, and, or a, I'm sorry, a private company went there and, and mined the resources on the moon, like helium three or you know whatever they find there, they could not claim that as their own because it would be whatever they mine would be the providence of all mankind, and the profit would have to be shared. So the United States didn't sign that, and, and, and there were many countries that did not sign. Even back in 1979, the United States wanted private companies to have the incentive to go to the moon on their own without government help because they're looking for a profit. And so although a private company cannot claim that part of the moon, they can mine it, whatever they bring back, they can sell and or use, use the moon um, for a profit, but they can't like claim the land. If that makes sense. So so there might be yeah. some gray areas in there. So these treaties, there, there is, we need lawyers, we need uh, smart uh, diplomats and leaders in governments around the world to come up with, I want to say, uh, more advanced, uh, because we're, we're actually going there now, uh, more advanced forms of these treaties that are fair. Absolutely. And I think this is a great way to to end our conversation, knowing that we could probably just take it straight from right from here and, and go to a vision of, of the future that touch humanity. And, and, and the fact that, yeah, I think I think we, we have to do it together. Uh, we, we can't just do it as individual. 
um, government. I, I'm a I'm a big uh, big believer of that. But with this, I want to thank you so much for this time. It's been a fascinating conversation. I'm gonna say that again. For me, it was a fascinating audiobook because that's what I listen. I mean, I love reading the book, but I can consume so many more when I walk the dogs or do other things and I can listen uh, those and podcast. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm going to finish it with the book. It's uh, Through the Glass Ceiling to the Stars. And it's the story of the first American woman to command a space mission. There it is uh, right there. So I honestly yeah. invite you to read it, to version of it, and, <laughs> and or listen to it. But because I enjoyed the the audiobook as well, and then uh, and then I'll, we'll love you know get in touch with Eileen, get in touch with us, comment on on social media on on this if you have read it already or if you will or if you had in a few weeks from now, and let us know what you think. In terms of ours, uh, you can stay tuned because we will be recording another episode soon again talking about the future of space exploration. And uh, again, Eileen, it's been an honor and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks. It's been great talking with you. Great. And for everybody else, stay tuned with Redefining Society and the ITSP Magazine. There'll be notes and link even to the book. And, uh, and uh, stay tuned for the next episode of Redefining Society podcast. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. If you learned something new and this story made you think, then share ITSP Magazine with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to associate your brand with our conversations, sponsor one or more of our columns. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. You can always find us at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society.